And so, without further ado, Father John Baptist Kuh. How is God our Father? First, I would just draw your attention to an outline that should be available to you. You can see on the YouTube live stream description, which has the, the four parts of the presentation and also the quotations from St. Thomas and Scripture that I'll be referring to. So I have four parts in this lecture. First, we look at the testimony of Scripture to tell us how God is our Father. And then from Aquinas, how the Trinity, the whole Trinity, is the Father of creatures. Third, though, how we address the Father directly. We've been taught by Jesus to do that. And then finally, a more modern concern, is God our Mother? So, how is God our Father? The short answer is, God is our Father because we are His children. And how have we become His children? God has adopted us through Christ. But in the broadest sense of sonship, and I mean the broadest possible sense, anything that has existence bears a trace of likeness to God because God is existence, and anything that has existence gets it from God. So all creatures of any kind may be thought of as having God as Father at some level. And we'll say more about this in section 2. So we are all children by Christian adoption, but even on the level of nature, the level of existence, just by having existence, we still call God our Father. Okay, but why should we humans think of God as our Father in the first place? Because Scripture reveals this emphatically. Emphatically because of the trajectory from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God is called Father in the Old Testament 22 times. And these, addressing, these cases of addressing God as Father fall into three categories. God is the Father of a people, God is the Father of the King, and God is the Father of individuals. So I give you one example for each of these, and you'll see the quotations on the outline. From Isaiah 63, 16, the prophet says, For you are our Father. We are, were Abraham not to know us, nor Israel to acknowledge us. You, Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer you are named from of old. So there, God is the Father of a people. He has a people. Second, the father of a king, we see from 2 Samuel 7, 14. The Lord says, I will be a father to Solomon, and he shall be a son to me. And then God is addressed as father by an individual. We see in Sirach 23, 1. Then Sirah says, Lord, father and master of my life, do not abandon me to their designs. Do not let me fall because of them. So that's the Old Testament, 22 times, and these fall into three categories. In the four Gospels alone, God is called Father 170 times. Just two examples from the Gospel of John. So John 1.18, the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. John 20.17, Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, Stop holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So 170 times, from 22 times to 170 times, if we miss that, we have missed the revelation. Jesus came to reveal the Father. We might recall one other passage from the Gospel of John, 14, chapter 14, verses 8 to 10. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and we shall be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works." So there should be no doubt that Scripture reveals God the Father to us. Okay, but there's an ambiguity here that we should sort out. When Jesus speaks of the Father, he means his Father, right? That is, God the Father in the Trinity. But can we claim his Father, the distinct person of God the Father, 
exclusively as our Father? After all, Christ is God, God the Eternal Son. So when we say that God is our Father, doesn't that include the Son? Doesn't that mean that the whole Trinity is our Father? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Well, yes. But hasn't Christ taught us to pray to His Father? Yes, again. Okay, so we're working on two levels here. The short answer is that on one hand, the whole Trinity is our Father, since all three divine persons create us, and thus all three have a paternal relation to us. So when we say that God is our Father, we mean that God, the whole Trinity, is our Father. But on the other hand, since we have been adopted in Christ, who is the Son, we are taught by Jesus to call His Father our Father. That is, we are to address the person of God the Father directly. We have this in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 23 and 26 and 27. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask anything of the Father, He will give it to you in my name. On that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father Himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from the Father. So we have two levels of address here, but they work together. They're not in competition. All three persons co-equally create us and thus co-equally have a paternal relation to creatures. But because of the order of persons within the Trinity, the Son is from the Father, the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son, we are led by the Holy Spirit to the Son who leads us back to the Father. That's the short answer. So now let's examine this dynamic in closer detail. What is the right way to understand God as our Father? So this is St. Thomas talking about fatherhood in the Summa Theologiae, the first part, question 33. He says, the perfect example of fatherhood, the ideal, the exemplar, the prime analogy to fatherhood, as the theologians say, is the relationship of God the Father to God the Son. So not God the Father to creatures, not God the whole Trinity to creatures, not any human father to any human son or daughter. Those are all examples of fatherhood. But all fatherhood is derivative of the truest fatherhood of God the Father to God the Son. We read from St. Paul, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 14, I bend my knee before the Father from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named. Why is this relationship between the Father and the Son the perfect example of fatherhood? Because, St. Thomas teaches, a birth is more perfect the more perfectly the Son resembles the Father in form or nature. Perfect fatherhood is when there is a perfect birth, which is when there is a perfect resemblance between father and son. So, you can give birth to an idea, but this is an analogous way of speaking since an idea doesn't have the same nature as you, namely a human nature. You can give birth to a child, and this is a birth, properly speaking. You produce another being of the same nature. Your child is of the same species. Now in God, the Father and the Son do not merely have the same nature according to species, as creaturely parents and offspring do. God the Father and God the Son have the numerically same nature, one same nature or essence. They are consubstantial, as we say in the Creed every Sunday. They are one same God. They have one same intellect and will, one real operation. This is a far greater unity than having the same nature according to species, where there are many separate members of the same nature that have different lives and existences. In God, the Father and the Son are distinct only by relation as St. Thomas says. That is, the Son is everything that the Father is except for Father. He cannot be absolutely everything that the Father is because He proceeds from the Father. 
But, St. Thomas says, the Father is not more like himself than he is to the Son. So this is a perfect likeness. Perfect. This is tr deep Trinitarian theology, so we can, uh, in the question session, we can certainly ask about this. If you, thought, if you found it profound and not immediately evident and easy to follow, uh, don't be alarmed. This is a very profound revelation which tests our imagination, and there nothing, there's nothing in the world that exists like this. God's mode of being is above ours. Here, Aquinas pushes back against a creaturely bias. The more intense, full, and perfect birth is not one that appears to produce more by begetting more richly diverse children. That would be true only where the father communicates a potency that he himself cannot realize, as is the case among creatures. Just think, what would be the richest example among humans of paternity? Well, you have one child who becomes a Supreme Court justice, one child who becomes a doctor and uh, gets a, designs a vaccine for COVID-19, uh, one, one child who becomes an astronaut, one child becomes you know, a saint, a great theologian. Okay, so that's among us because the potency is not possessed, all potencies is not possessed by the parent. But in fact, the most absolutely perfect birth possible is exemplified by a father who possesses every perfection in the first place, without exception, every perfection, and is able to communicate all that he is to the son. So not part of it, but if you have everything and you can give everything perfectly, that is the highest and most perfect example of paternity and filiation. We think of father and mother making a shared contribution, and this parenthood is analogous to divine fatherhood, but the most perfect definition is found in God where no one shares in the contribution of producing the son, the father is the only principle. He has everything and he gives everything. So, the name father refers first of all to the person of the father with respect to the son. But, observes St. Thomas, it can also in a secondary manner refer to God with respect to creatures. What? You say, can we consider ourselves born of God the Trinity? That is, are we living offspring somehow of the same nature? Well, in an analogous way, shockingly, yes. God's fatherhood in relation to the universe is but a likeness of this perfect Trinitarian fatherhood. Our analogous sonship is based on the broadest possible interpretation of fatherhood and sonship, namely, receiving being from another. By the way, when I say sons, I'm using this word, sons here applies generically to all humans, male or female. We are all sons insofar as we are assimil assimilated to Christ the Son, and the Virgin Mary is the most perfect example of this Christian sonship. But so the broadest possible interpretation of being a son is receiving being from a father. So like us, God the Son receives from the Father all that he has and is. But God the Son has by nature what he receives. This is a deep mystery. So the Son could not not be. He necessarily is. He is God no less than the Father. But he receives everything from the Father. The Father gives it to him. The Father, as St. Thomas says, it's, the language can be frightening, produces the Son. But not as a creature, not by free will. The Son is equally God. In contrast, a creature is a Son by gift, freely willed by God. We could certainly have not been created. God was free to create us or not create us. Thomas does not entertain the idea here in this analogy that Father should be applied to the person of God the Father with respect to us. Rather, creatures are sons of the whole Trinity by participating in the sonship of God the Son with respect to the person of God the Father. While, while our adoptive sonship does lead us back to the person of the Father. Aquinas insists on the four-term analogy, and you see that on your outline. God the Father is to God the Son, as God the Trinity is to creatures. While perhaps shocking to modern sensibilities, in his commentary on the Our Father, St. Thomas suggests that the Lord's Prayer is addressed not only to the Father, but also to the Son. We address the Our Father to the whole Trinity. 
Aquinas affirms that we can and do address the person of the Father directly and specifically in prayer, but the Our Father, according to Aquinas, would most naturally be addressed to the whole Trinity. All three persons have a paternal relationship to creatures, for they are equally the uncreated source of creatures. Praying the Our Father to the whole Trinity is perfectly reasonable, given that we fittingly ask the Son and the Holy Spirit to forgive our trespasses, to give us our daily bread, and to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As regards the Lord's Prayer, Scripture makes it clear that it is not the Son's Prayer. Right? You could have that impression, the Son prays this. No. Although the Savior takes on sinner's punishment, He cannot properly join us in praying that our trespasses be forgiven. Jesus clearly says in the three synoptic Gospels, when you pray, so let's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we'll take as a, the examples from there, and from Matthew, do not be like the hypocrites, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, our Father who art in heaven. So pray then, you pray this. From Mark, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Right, so you stand praying, your Father. And from Luke, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Jesus distinguishes between Father and God with respect to himself and with respect to creatures. So let's go back to John 20, 17, which we quoted earlier. Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So we have this analogy. God the Father to God the Son is like God the Trinity to adoptive sons. It is true that by virtue of the incarnation, we call the Son our brother, right? We call Jesus our brother and his father, our father, which we're led to do by adoption. But whereas being our brother is proper to the incarnate son, right, not to the Holy Spirit or to the father, being our father is not proper to God the Father, but is common to the Trinity. Creatures are sons analogously by participation. Since the act of creation is not proper to any of the divine persons, but is common to all three, the whole Trinity must be the father of creatures, for the whole Trinity is the uncreated principle of all creatures. Our status as sons and daughters, despite our justified euphoria, does not eliminate the distinction between the created and uncreated realms. God retains His sovereign majesty. The Son and the Holy Spirit still have a paternal relation with respect to us. On this point, Aquinas does not succumb to the temptation to weaken the mystery of God's transcendent, uncreated majesty in order to establish an intimate and elevated place for us before God. His insistence on the whole Trinity as the Father of creation does not close us off from an intimate relationship with God the Father, but rather underscores God's otherness to the created universe and clarifies the precious an indispensable role of revelation. This is an invitation. This is a great gift. Uh, astounding. So, what of John 3.16 then, where Jesus teaches us to speak to his Father? We do this in the liturgy, for instance, right? Prayers are so often addressed to the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit. How and why do we do this? Well, St. Thomas explains in his commentary on the sentences, he says that those things that are of the divine essence are in the other persons, so the Son and the Spirit, from the Father. And therefore, there is a certain leading back from the other persons to the Father. And on account of this, the Father is even called the principle of the whole deity. 
and leading us thus back to the Father as to the principle without a principle, Christ taught us to direct prayer to the Father through the Son. Christian prayer thus follows a Trinitarian order. For Aquinas, this is always the case. Commenting on the verse where Jesus tells his disciples that they will pray to the Father directly, Aquinas concludes that Christ taught the apostles that they had direct access to the Father, but this access is still in Christ's name. So a quotation from Aquinas' commentary on John, verse 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 26. Thomas explains that Jesus, as great a teacher as he was, would not have been understood by his disciples if he did not open their minds to the truth interiorly through the Holy Spirit. So, quote, Even the Son himself, speaking by means of the instrument of his humanity, does not prevail unless he himself works interiorly through the Holy Spirit. The Trinitarian order is always preserved. The Holy Spirit leads us to the Son, makes the Son intelligible to us, opens our minds to what he's saying, and the Son shows the Father to us. The true and natural Son always intercedes for adoptive sons. Let us not forget that the Son and the Holy Spirit also adopt. But adoptive sons can address the Father specifically by name. This both affirms Christ's definitive revelation of the Father to us, giving us access to Him, and shows our dependence on the Son and the Holy Spirit, who play an indispensable role in the order of the rational creature's return to the Father. The Son comes forth from the Father, and creatures come forth from the whole Trinity. All things return to the Father, but because of our sonship in grace, whereby we share in the Son's relationship to the Father, we share in the Son's inheritance. Aquinas writes in his commentary on the sentences, The Son leads us to the glory of our paternal inheritance since he is the true and natural Son of God. And he observes in his commentary on St. John, he observes that the vision of the Father is the end of all our desires and actions, and nothing else is necessary. So Philip was right on this point. When we see the Father, that will be enough for us. We will be satisfied. There's no further, higher end to get to. The Father is what satisfies us. So it should be clear that while Thomas might betray a medieval sentiment rather foreign to our own in maintaining that the Our Father and the Abba, that our filial hearts cry out, are addressed to the whole Trinity, he in no way rejects the notion that we address the Father specifically. Rather, he is very conscious of the fact that as finite creatures, we also properly address the whole Trinity as Father. So, God is properly named Father. Is God also our mother? The short answer would be, one could profitably cultivate a private devotion, but it's limited in its reach. And, and there are some drawbacks, so let's, let's look at this. First, some clarifications. God is pure spirit. This is, you cannot lose track of this. He's pure spirit. There's no sexual differentiation in God, no division of male and female. So, God the Father is not a guy. He's not a man. God has no consort. In fact, this distinguishes the Christian God from some pagan gods who do have consorts, who, who are gendered. God is the source of everything. He has all perfections, male and female. He is without differentiation of any sexual kind. God is the source of all perfections, so of course he has all masculine and feminine perfections, male and female plants and animals get their male and female perfections where? From the eternal, omnipotent God who is pure spirit. So we should have no fear in associating him with feminine perfections if they're absolute perfection. For instance, having the power to give birth. God the Son joined a human nature to himself that is of the male gender, but in his divine nature, he has no gender. So we should be clear on that. God is pure spirit with no bodily sexual differentiation. That would be a gross mistake. In Scripture, there are strong imagery of God as the bridegroom, where the church or Israel is the bride. 
and their strong imagery of God as father, Israel, the king, or an individual is the son or daughter. So these are images which are in Revelation and which we should cherish and would be a, a shame to lose by uh, overemphasizing or, or seeking out a maternal image. However, there are maternal images in Scripture, but there are few, and there are less direct comparisons. But let's look at those. They're, they're important. The feminine images that are presented in the Old Testament, maybe five, still refer to God in masculine verbal forms and pronouns. Hebrew has the, the endings of Hebrew verbs show they're gendered. They, they say whether the subject is masculine or feminine. So the five that appear uh, show up in 2 Isaiah in the Pentateuch. So first from Isaiah 42, 14, I have said nothing, holding myself in, like a woman in labor. I groan, I gasp, and pant together. Isaiah 45, 10, Woe to him who says to a father, What are you begetting? Or to a woman, With what are you in travail? Isaiah 49, 14 and 15, Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Isaiah 66, 13. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And then from Deuter Deuteronomy, and we find similarly in Exodus. He kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. We also have wisdom referred to as feminine in Proverbs, wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, Matthew, and Luke. But she's not equated to God. Still, she's divine wisdom. The lone feminine image in the New Testament for God is suggested by Jesus, clearly male, who likens himself to a hen gathering her brood. So this is Matthew 23, 37, and Luke 13, 34. So let's read the one from Matthew. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? So maternal images aren't absent from divine revelation, but we see they're fewer and they're less direct. God reveals himself as Father. Also, divine maternity should make us think of Mary. I remember searching for, uh, looking among a master's theses, and there was a title that said Divine Maternity. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. It's you know, some feminist question, but actually it was about Mary. And I thought, oh, of course, divine maternity. It would be a shame to overshadow Mary's place in our spiritual lives by uh, losing, losing track of that. Mary does what the Father does. Mary begets a son. The Father is the Father because he gives birth to the Son. Among us, mothers do this. So the father possesses all perfections, masculine and feminine. We also have imminent and transcendent symbols of mother and father, just in the psychology of humans. Uh, Dr. Paul Witz has done good work on this. So, you know, a child is, is in the mother's womb for nine months, hears the mother's voice for nine months, and when is born, hardly distinguishes himself from his mother. The father, on the other hand, is this tra transcendent other. Who is this other voice? Who is this other person? So these are figures, Dr. Paul Witz notes, that many of the, the famous atheists didn't have fathers in their lives. So just you're, it's psychologically, these symbols are powerful, and you can be at a disadvantage uh, if losing the, trans, this, the transcendent symbol of the father. So the conclusion would be, my conclusion would be, private devotion. If, you, if, you, if this is somehow fruitful for you, that's okay, but it's limited, and it would be counterproductive to overshadow Our Lady's role in the life of faith and to place ourselves at a distance from the language of revelation by elevating maternal images of God to the forefront. Also, if you hate fatherhood because of your experience of fatherhood on earth, the first step is to redeem that, to find healing. Revising revelation and reality as a given is not the solution to the problem. Trauma shouldn't be the norming principle for interpreting revelation. So just to sum up then, in the four steps, we've thought about how God is our Father, first with a testimony of Scripture, and we saw the trajectory from the Old Testament to the New Testament. 
We should certainly not miss the revelation. God is our Father. The Son has come into the world to reveal the Father, and he, the Holy Spirit draws to the Son, who reveals the Father. Then the whole Trinity can be thought of as the Father of creatures. This is important to affirm the divinity of the Son and the Holy Spirit, who also, with God the Father, have a paternal relation to us. But Jesus has taught us. We've been adopted through Christ. Jesus has taught us to pray directly to the Father, and we do that in the liturgy, and it's a powerful Christian prayer. This is the, this is the pattern. The, trini the order of, the, There's a Trinitarian order in prayer where we do address the Father. And is God our mother? Again, as a private devotion, if you find that fruitful, that's fine. But the church, you see, treasures and celebrates the, the liturgy publicly according to Revelation, and God has revealed himself as a father. So that is how God is our father. So we have... Ah, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, father John Baptist, thank you very much for a, uh, a great talk and uh, very illuminating to uh, enter into all of those questions about the fatherhood of God. We do have time for some questions and we've got a whole list of them uh, from our viewers at home. So maybe we should start with uh, the point that you raised at the end, which is about the Our Father. Okay. Oh, okay. So Rachel Williams asks this through YouTube. Is Jesus praying to himself as well as to the Father when he gives us the Our Father? Okay, good. Excellent. So thank you for that question. So um, again, so Jesus isn't praying this prayer. He's teaching us to do it. So, uh, but when you, yeah, so that, that's, that's a simple answer. Um, there is, there are some, some uh, funny dynamics when you have Jesus in his human nature uh, related to his divine nature because his divine nature is, in his divine nature, he's God. In his human nature, there are, you do get that dynamic sometimes where he is, he is, he, his, his human nature is um, relying on or, or uh, related to his divine nature as, well as, as, as a creature. So you get that, his, his, his reality spans the created and uncreated uh, order. So that, that you get that funny dynamic. But for the Our Father, no, actually, he doesn't pray that prayer. So you don't have that there. That's, that's a prayer just for us. Very good. So another question coming to us from Kathy Salter, also through YouTube. Is it correct that the spirit uh, in Greek is pneuma, which is a female noun? And what implications would that have? Ta pneuma? Is that, is that, it's not hey, it's te, I think it's uh, neuter actually, but I have heard, but anyway. So, um, yeah, so the, 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 we have the, the pronouns we use and the images we have from scripture. So the spirit is referred to as, as he. he the, uh, so the Holy Spirit, uh, so what we, as I said, so the disadvantage would be to introduce sexual differentiation to say, well, in God, there's actually a division of masculine and feminine. You have father and the son who are guys, and you have this lady, the Holy Spirit. That would be most unfortunate. So again, all three parts, we think of God has one intellect, one will, no no body, no, no sexual differentiation, but we have lady wisdom as, as uh, an image, so f there are feminine images, and God, the Father, has all perfections, masculine and feminine. So we shouldn't think of women being cut off or, or being less like God. Again, who's the best example of sonship? Mary. Okay, so that, let that be clear. But the I wouldn't pursue a line of saying, well, in some languages, uh, the spirit has is is feminine according to its uh, you know it, it's a gender language that this is something to be developed at length. I think you the spirit especially is we think of uh, as not uh, with a body right spirit. Uh, so uh, and and the, the 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 revelation gives us he and if you look at the the verbs as I say well that, that would be in Greek in the New Testament. So um, but yeah so the. That I wouldn't make too much of the, the fact that it's it's taught neumat though, right? So, um, yeah. But so, w women are not left out. Femininity is, as John Paul II says in his uh, uh, encyclical or apostolic exhortation on the vocation and dignity of women, the resources of femininity are certainly no less than of masculinity. But better to keep sexual differen differentiation out of God, and uh, just recognize He is the source of all perfections for men and women. Great. Well, uh, another question related to what you've just been saying. This comes from Bart Upart through Zoom. Since God is neither 
female nor male, as you've said, and yet scripture is filled with female imagery uh, also when talking of God, such as a woman giving birth, a woman, woman nursing her children. Is it all right to use this female Im imagery in liturgical or private devotions? Yeah, so I think private devotion is fine. Let's say, let's say you, f you find it fruitful, it's powerful, and especially if, as I say, unfortunately sometimes fatherhood, some people's experience of fatherhood among earthly fathers is difficult, so at least for now you might really try to uh, come to the Lord as, um, you know, by, by maternal images more, more powerfully or more ably, that's, that's fine. The, the liturgy you'll see because Christ is the bridegroom, uh, there's, and there's a whole, you know, there's, there's an intelligibility to gender which, which God exploits, which God uses. There's Mary, so we have a church as the bride, we have Mary, mother of God. So that would be, the church I think you'll see is, will never um, prefer other symbolism. So uh, again, so private devotion, yes, and there are maternal images in scripture, and uh, Lady Wisdom, is a, is a, it's a, that's a a powerful feminine image, which the fathers of the church ascribed to Christ. Um, they didn't, they, they, when, when arguing with Arius, they didn't say, oh, well, that doesn't apply to Christ. Lady Wisdom doesn't, no, they, they presumed it did and made arguments from, from Scripture based on that. So, yeah, so private devotion, fine. But, um, again, it, we wouldn't want Mary to lose her place as in her divine maternity. And also, uh, we, we put ourselves at a distance from the, the, the culture, the thinking, the language of Scripture, and the liturgy. So we have another question, this time from one of our uh, live viewers coming to us through Zoom. So this is from Anselm Lefebvre, one of our student leaders at the University of Oregon. So Anselm, please go ahead. Hi, Father. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, it's, it's very common, we're very used to speaking of um, priests as being conformed to Christ through their ordination, and I'm wondering if you could speak about any way in which they are also conformed to the Father, um, and, it, when, and they, it, do they share in the fatherhood of God uh, in any particular way? Fantastic, okay. So, right, conform to Christ because they even speak uh, his, his words uh, that are not their own in the sacrament of the Eucharist. They, they speak uh, in confession, they say, your sin, I, for, I forgive you, I absolve you. Well, I mean, no, actually, Christ is obvious, but I'm speaking in the person of Christ. That's a powerful thing. But yes, we actually accord them the title of Father because they uh, give birth to, if in, in the sacrament of baptism, for instance, as ministers of the sacrament, they give birth to uh, children in the church, right? They, they initiate children for the church. So in that way, um, they, can, they share in, in uh, divine paternity, but never with respect to the Son, right? They're never... A principle of the Son in any way, always conform to the Son, but because God the Son uh, does the work of the Father and He sends out ministers to teach and preach and heal in His name, then yes, so the Father has everything, the Son has everything from the Father, so if you're conformed to the Son, you, you certainly can, you'll have, uh, you'll be made like the Father in a certain way as well. But the one thing we never would lose track of is that we would never have a, a paternal relation, like in, in being conformed to the Father, we would never have a paternal relation to the, to the Son or never think of ourselves as a principle to the Spirit. So, but, but yes, otherwise, as having properties or perfections communicated to us uh, that make us like the Father in some way, yes. And in fact, bearing the, the title Father on account of that. And even human fathers and, human and, and, and women, bear, mother, which uh, bears the perfection of, of fathers, uh, bear those titles as well, because they bring, they bring life into the world. They're instruments of, of, of God, and in that way they, they beget children, and they have their fathers and mothers of, of children. Yeah, excellent. Our next question comes from Santiago Pinzon through Zoom, uh, and he asks this, if we're to say that the Son received being from the Father in a perfect birth, how are we to think of the Trinity if we say that God has always existed and is in fact being, ex being itself? Would the Father have existed before the Son and the Holy Spirit? Or is it an error to think of this chronologically given that God is outside of time? Fantastic, exactly. No, you got it. So, right, not in time. No before and after. St. Thomas is, is very clear on this. In the Trinity, there's order without priority. Absolutely no priority. Uh, priority in time, 
no priority in power or glory or goodness. So, again, this is a great mystery, but so the Son receives everything from the Father, the Spirit receives everything from the Father and the Son, but not in time. The Father, in fact, if there's no Son, there's no Father. The Father is, fa is, is, is Father because he's, he has a, he's begetting a Son. So the Father has from all eternity been begetting the Son. He always ever will, and he's, He is right now. So always was, is now, always ever will be. Time is, is what, how we experience, right? We, we move through before and after. God does not move uh, but, but through before and after. So he simply is, and the Trinity simply was. They were exactly right. In fact, this was what Arius claimed, there was a time when the Son was not. And so the, the earliest fathers of the church uh, said, no, God is the Father is never without his wisdom. The Son always ever was. The Holy Spirit always ever was. Excellent. That's, that's an important theological uh, question that we, we should, the Christians, that's what makes us Christians and not uh, Arians or, yeah, um, heretics. <laughs> Which certainly we don't want to become. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so there's a follow-up question here from um, one of our viewers through YouTube who asks this, and, and it's related to what you were just saying, and I'm going to add a little, uh, a little twist on this. Does the Father exist above space and time so as to be everywhere and available to everyone? But maybe you could say a little more about what it means to talk about the divine eternity and uh, compare that. We had a talk uh, this past week with uh, Father Basil Cole about angels and the eternity of angels versus the eternity of God. Or uh, can, you, can you give some illumination on that point? Okay, fantastic. So God is eternal, so there's no succession in God. So yes, God the Father is everywhere, in fact, all the time, and in fact, there, if there's a place to call there, right, it's, it's only because God is producing it. So everywhere, immediately, by his power, presence, and essence. Angels, that's a great contrast, actually. Um, angels start to exert their power and then stop. So they can be in a lot of places, which for us could seem like everywhere, but they, they begin to exert their power somewhere in the created in the universe and then stop. So they can't be everywhere the way God is. God is, if there is a thing, if there is a place, it's only existing because God is there by the effect of his power. He's producing whatever is there, uh, or it's making it a place or making it uh, somewhere where something is. So, so yes, God is immediately, effortlessly everywhere because he's, he's the source of, from the inside, by the effect of his power, he is, he is, he is there. Otherwise, nothing would exist. Angels uh, have, have great power compared to us. But they, again, they, they're, the ab eternity is what St. Thomas says. By nature, they share in eternity, participate, but um, they, have, um, they do have some before and after, right? They chose for or against God. They also change, Aquinas says, in their affections, like your guardian angel. This is interesting, right? On account of our actions, doing good or evil, they can change their affections. And, and also, if they start to act in a place and stop acting, uh, they, they change. And they even have one idea at a time. Now, that wouldn't be, we say, for, like for us, you could have a stopwatch and see how long it took for us to move from idea to idea, right, MRI scanner or something. Angels, it's, it's not like it's a lapse of time, of seconds, but there's a before and an after. In God, there's no before and after, no succession. Eternity, properly speaking, eternity is God. God is existence, goodness, subsisting truth, being. Uh, he, he, he simply is uh, without division without potency, perfectly simple, without composition. So nothing else is like that. Nothing is simply being, infinite being, uh, with, without differentiation, uh, just, just the source of all being and, and being itself. Ipsum esse per se subsistent. Being itself, sub, sub, self-subsisting being itself. That's how Aquinas describes God and his divine nature. That's uh, really wonderful and very, very profound. And so let me, uh, we, have a, we have a list of, of other questions, but I want to just kind of keep going with this same line of questioning. So you mentioned potency and act or perfect actuality, like God just being with no possibility of changing. And that's probably something that a lot of our viewers would be very interested to hear a little more about. Could you speak about, uh, about that idea of the, that God doesn't change uh, and what that means and maybe connect that to the procession of the persons, because there it does, to our mind, at least when you first hear it, think, it makes you think of changes, like the sun being begotten, for example. Right, right. So, God is, 
act absolutely without potency. When we say he can't change, it's not like he's locked up and doesn't change. When we think of something that doesn't change, sometimes we think of um, something that, that is static, right? So what, what doesn't change? You know, maybe like a, like, right, we, we, styrofoam, like it takes thousands of years to, to, to grow. So like a piece of styrofoam floating around in space that just, you know, can, maybe can last forever. But no, no, with God, he doesn't change because he's everything that he, something could possibly be. So he has nowhere, nothing to change into. He can't get better. He's not going anywhere. He's already everything already. So he, he is also, his, his, so his immutability is a dynamic life. So it's, it's, it's dynamic. It's, it's, I'll just look at, you know, he created the universe, right? Okay, this is someone who has power, who has life. So he is, he is, he is life. He is being, he's goodness. So, so not, uh, so he's not, he's not uh, immutable as in uh, locked up and, and afraid, sort of like, you know, he can't, he's, he's trying to defend, fend off things that would make him change. No, he is unlimited. He can't, he has nowhere to go. Unlimited, total act, no potency, nothing, nothing unrealized. We are constantly moving from one state to another, going somewhere, trying to get better, trying to resolve things, right? We're moving, we're, we're always in Aristotelian terms, sloughing off accidental forms and taking on new ones. We're trying to per become, perfect ourselves and move toward good and away from evil. God is already, he's already totally realized. That he's reached, not reached, he is from the beginning. He is uh, everything already. So, um, that, so that's, that's, that's God's reality. And then, right, whenever we think of God, it's, it's hard, we, we immediately, it's easy for us to draw the mystery into the orbit of reason. I, and not because we're dumb, because, but because it's our nature, right? We, we go by experience. So our, our imagine, right, theology, this is one of the roles of speculative theology, is to lead us to contemplation, right? It stretches out your imagination, and you read the mystics, you read St. Thomas, and it just, it, it, you see, sometimes you glimpse how different God is, and it can be unsettling, especially if you had images of God, you know, you learned when you were a kindergartner, or you're, you got when you were in seventh grade or something, and sometimes that gets purified and stripped away, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I was relying on that image. But so then you see, oh, wow, God is so far above, right? Think of, um, uh, and Father Dominic studied it in Freiburg also, I don't know if you were, were, uh, went up into the, the, the Alps there, where uh, Jungfrau, uh, the, the virgin, the <clears throat> so is, is, the, is the big mountain, and uh, I was on one of the smaller ones, I forget which one, and I looked across and um, I saw this, this peak up through the clouds, and I, and I thought, Oh, wow, that's really, really high. But then the clouds parted, and I saw, no, that was just a snow patch. The mountain, you couldn't even see the top of the mountain. Sometimes theology, right, it's, when we think about God, or this is the experience of the mystics, God is, is not like us. He's not like us. He's, we bear a real similarity to him because he created us. We're effects of him as the cause. But he is more, he, he infinitely, he's infinite being, so he's more dissimilar than similar. So, this is a constant problem for us theologians, right? You're constantly trying to get the good analogies, make clarifications, and this is we talk about the via negativa in theology, constantly saying, oh, he's like this. Well, but not quite. And then you make a, a bunch of uh, negations, say, not like this, not like this, not like this, because that's a creaturely limitation. So yes, when we think about the Trinity, the procession of the Son from the Father, the procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son, so easy, right? We're constantly trying to say, wait, but not in time, no before and after, no, you know, cause and effect, just giving. Just, and this is also the way God was from all eternity, is. And we, we, are, we participate in this, we share, gives, we have some glimmer of that in us because God is our cause and, and we resemble Him in some way. But yes, we're constantly, uh, I, I tell you, when you, do, when you work in Trinitarian theology, there are many ways to go wrong. Even after many years, you, you say something, you even write something, you're like, oh no, not like that. So we are, we are tested constantly. God is without potency, unchanging, but not because of any limitation or fear, like so this is sort of being, being bound up or inert. No, he is, he is dynamic life, and he, he, there's nothing for him to, to get to change into. He's already everything. But yes, when we think about the processions, we think about the Son receiving everything from the Father, we have to constantly remind ourselves that this is not like things in the world. Because even, as St. Thomas says, of, of our language, right, we say the Son is born. You say, oh, so that's passive. There's passivity in the Son because the Father begets and the Son is begotten. St. Thomas says, no, 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 no. It's a problem with our language. 
we'll use better language. Well, we don't have better language. For us, the best way to signify this is with, we think of the procession. We have active and passive. There's no better way. We're like, it's our condition, not, not because we're, you know, on account of sin. Well, that, that causes problems too, of course. But simply, we are limited, and so we approach Trinitarian theology uh, carefully. St. Thomas quotes St. Augustine on this, right? There's nothing more dangerous, but there's also nothing more fruitful. So we have a modesty about a, a, where we can get, but we also are confident that we've received a revelation. So we're not just babbling and uh, you know, say, well, you have your metaphors, I have mine. No, no, there's a, we can say things correctly, incorrectly. God has given us such a gift that we can actually make error. We, we, can, we can say things right about God and, or, or wrong about God. We're not just um, you know, parsing, stuck in our own minds, parsing our own um, uh, images. We actually can make right and wrong predications about God. But so yes, God is absolutely perfect, absolutely without composition, totally in act, everything, anything could possibly be. Uh, so unchanging, just plenitude of life and, and goodness and being. Let's go to uh, another very interesting and sometimes contentious or, or controversial subject, which you've touched on briefly, and that's about uh, the incarnation giving us a masculine Jesus. So uh, is the son male as God? Is, he's obviously male as man. And uh, can you connect that to uh, the priesthood and the fatherhood of God? So uh, how do you put all of that together? Okay, great. So, uh, so God in his, the Son, in his divine essence, has no sexual differentiation. Absolutely, absolutely none. It's fitting, so here's the thing, when, when God does things, right, we, we may not know, we can't see. Could God have done it otherwise? Could God have become a woman, uh, incarnate as a woman? Of, of course. Uh, St. Thomas talks about, also, could the Father have become incarnate? Yes. How about the Spirit? The Father and the Spirit could have become incarnate, and also not just in one human nature, but several, or eight or ten. And you say, wow, that sounds kind of grotesque and irreverent. Well, if it's not against God's omnipotence, then God can do it. So that's, that's, what, that's why we would affir Aquinas is affirming that, because if it's God can do anything that's, that's not self-contradictory in, in some way that way. So, but it's fitting. There's a fittingness to what God does. So theologians should take Revelation, ponder it, and, and benefit from it. We can't always say, oh, it has to be this way, or, or, but we, we can say, oh, it's fitting, and, and let's see the richness and the truth about it. With respect to um, taking on, uh, becoming a man, not a woman, and, and uh, the priesthood, it's very interesting. Father Benedict Ashley uh, concedes to some feminists who, who were concerned about uh, abuse, right, of women at the hands of men, and he says, that's why Christ came as, as in, the in the type of Adam, because if Adam is the oppressor, Christ comes to show how men should be, to, lay us to have power, to have headship, to have advantages, um, you know, the effect of preponderance of testosterone, to, to, to lay that aside and show that true headship is enacted in service and generosity, not in domination. And he says, women on, he says, symbolize the, the church, Right, and so that if God had become, if, if Christ had been a woman, He couldn't symbolize the the redemption of, of of oppression of women in the same way. So there's a fittingness. Again, we can see there are, uh, again, could God have done it differently? Sure, but there's a fittingness, and and even to the very heart of the question, right, a concern about a male domination. This is precisely what Christ comes to redeem. If you look at the with respect to fatherhood, if you think of uh, just even look at the animal kingdom. Uh, let's look at birds. Um, do you like birds? I hope you like birds. The male birds are colorful and the females are not. Why? Because then they're the more visible ones, so they're the more, ones more likely to be caught and eaten by the cat. So they have in their very feathers, in their very body, they are marked for laying down their life for a mother and child. Well, gosh, isn't that what St. Paul says, right? That the this is what, love your wives, right? Uh, lay your life down for her. And, and isn't that what Christ did for the church? So there is a, 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 the roles, so again, masculinity, men and women, masculinity and femininity have, have a deep and rich intelligibility. 
and the fall in the, in the Garden of Eden, St. John, uh, John Paul writes in that same uh, encyclical uh, uh, on the vocation and dignity of women, he said, that was more injurious or, or put, it's jeopardized Eve more than Adam. Because now if you have the power grab, so communion with God, the human community, God, so Adam and Eve, and between God, that's, that's ruptured, and even between Adam and Eve. And so when the power grab is on, Adam has advantages. And this, as I say, right, this, this, the strong feminist line is sometimes very unfortunately is for women to overcome their femininity and become men. Because why? Because you want to be as uh, uh, forceful or, or as, as um, aggressive as, as men. So, but that's, that's no solution. Better is, again, to follow Christ's model to show true headship is in service and generosity. So that would work for the priesthood. It works for human fathers. It works for unmarried men where uh, Eve should be calling Adam to follow Christ's headship, to be conformed to Christ, and not to, um, to say he has no, no headship or that there's no difference, right, in our society now, gosh, with, you know, so many problems about gender, right, that there's no intelligibility, uh, there's so much fluidity, you just make it up as you go along. That's not true to nature, and it's um, uh, dissatisfying, even if it seems in, a short, in the short term to give some... Uh, relief to certain problems. Uh, nature is strong, and the reality is the reality. You just look at boys and girls playing, uh, and um, yeah, better is to accept the reality as given. It's beautiful. God divinely intended, right? He create as he, he, that we be created as men and women, and so Christ shows us the right way for us to live together and to overcome and reverse the effects of original sin, which, as John Paul says, was more. Um, injurious to Eve than to Adam. So a number of people have brought up in some of the YouTube comments and elsewhere uh, questions about how to think this through if you've had like in, uh, a person who's had a very perhaps uh, bad relationship with a father yeah. and uh, or maybe a very abusive father uh, or uh, some some other uh, very traumatic um, and painful experience like that. Could you speak to that uh, from your perspective as a as a theologian who's worked on God the Father? So it's, it's of course, difficult. So um, uh, be patient with yourself if you uh, find the, the... So some people could suffer abuse and still find the, the idea of God the Father consoling, in fact, because you see that this is what fatherhood should be. So you read, you read the, the scriptures and, you, and, you're, and you're, you're moved by that. Great, no problem. But someone could find whenever, just whenever you hear the word, it just, it just, it just, it's, um, un it's, it's unsettling or it grates on your nerves somehow. So this would be something to take to prayer. Ask Our Lady's intercession. That's that was so fortunate to have her as an intercessor, because then if you if you find again maternal images for private uh, cultivation, great, or and Our Lady especially, I think, right. So if you find her approachable, ask her to 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 uh, help you um, heal. And um, so the to, first is to get our minds right, because sometimes we know, we say, well, I know, I know God, so God's revealed as a father, and I know that's, that's right. But in your just feelings, right, you're just, your unreflective reaction is one of revulsion. It, uh, so then that's, that's something, again, to take the prayer and to have your mind right and, and be patient with yourself and, and bring those, uh, ask the Lord to, to redeem, to heal those uh, your dispositions there, and also yes, pray for the conversion of your father. And and again, you know, if they're depending on how proximate the situation is, you know, do do not um, allow yourself to be abused. Um, it, find you know, uh, find protection and help. Um, so it's difficult, but many have have dealt with this and overcome it. Men have been acting poorly for from from the beginning. So um, not that that's any consolation, but but women have. Um, overcome this. This is, this is something that, that can be dealt with, that can be healed, uh, and that so, so that you can come to know and love God the Father, uh, who is the source of all goodness, and uh, who sent the Son to die for us, so that we might be redeemed, so that, um, yeah, human fathers could be converted, and so that, um, yeah, of course, that all of us can be converted, but also to confront, to speak truth to power, if you like, so um, Jesus models that for us as well. He, you, you might turn to his his own suffering, his own, uh, yeah, so that Christians can, can suffer uh, valiantly 
and, uh, be, and be raised up, not be destroyed, but be strengthened. So, Father John Baptist, we're running out of time, but let me just ask, uh, this is actually kind of a, a big and separate question. It uh, takes us into another domain. And uh, feel free to, you know, we'll, we can go over uh, the one-hour time limit here for your answer. Uh, so, Daniel Furtado asks this question from Zoom. How do we understand the difference between how we relate to the Father and the Trinity as adopted sons, as Christians uh, in, in Christ, and how non-Christians relate to God as Father? Okay, yeah, great. So non-Christians wouldn't distinguish the persons. So they would think of, so Jews, Muslims would think of just God, and, and they, they relate to him. So they, you could say they relate to the whole Trinity without knowing it, right? They would just say, well, God. And, and, and the Jews would, have, would think of God as Father, right? So there are a few, as I say, 22 times in the, in the Old Testament. So um, Christians are, are invited to share in the, the Trinity's own life, so we have that distinct perspective, that, that um, fullness of revelation, that uh, adoption, so that we're aware that there are three persons in God, that God is a community of persons, which explains a lot of why we're made for communion and why we, so, you know, why we need communion, why friendship is, is the, you know, it's the highest, is, is, is charity, and why we're, um, uh, we would die without, without communion. So, uh, because God Himself is is communion, and we're made for that. So, uh, so we have the knowledge first of all, and then so we we would address the Father directly through the Son in the Spirit. The, uh, the non non Christians wouldn't do that. Even believers, right? Those who worship the God of Abraham, would um, would address God simply as God. So that actually works, right? With with Saint with the way Saint Thomas has it, we all three persons would. Uh, have, have a, a paternal relation to us. They wouldn't distinguish the persons, but so they simply address God as Father, if, if at least the Jews. And um, so we, we, we do the same, but we also, through our adoption in Christ, even address the Father directly, whom they uh, have not re received the revelation of. So they would be um, without that gift. Yet, through, through our preaching, uh, may they come to it, and may we come to embrace it all the more confidently.